Hello. <laughs> that I've seen you like this for free. Oh, I'll cut you check. <laughs> I'm going to cut you check. Oh, I'm fine, but I'm tired. I had my first life design workshop today, so I'm so as in when you just said, Let's move it to nine. You can't hear me. Come on, not every day hear you at all. You can't hear me. Yes, I can hear you now. Now, nah, okay. So I said, I had my first life design workshop today, and oh. I, I was on my feet teaching from 10 till 4 p.m. So when you now said we should move it to nine, I said, oh, God is good. Let me sleep small again. <laughs> oh, Bob, we, we, we would have been scheduled now. This what we no, no, no. Ah, so. hmm. You were the plan wedding. You are your new bride. Ah, when well, I see you for free like this, you cannot leave it to Old bride. No, new bride. You are really excited about this thing you're doing. But what, what brought about, how did you come about wanting to actually renew your vows? Yeah. Tell me the story. Oh, I lost her for a minute there. Network. This network is well. Sorry, guys. Let's see if she connects back. Sorry, I lost her there. I'm sure she'll connect back. We have amazing internet here. Yeah. Amazing internet. I don't like to use negative words to express negative situations. I'm sure she'll connect back now. Oh, my. Okay, just a minute. Let me check. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'm sure she had internet issues. We'll just give her a few. Connect back. Maybe I should continue my conversation about, okay, she's back. Okay. She's back. Okay. They are back. It's very bad. I know. I can imagine. Sometimes I get those days here to myself. I think I'm just lucky today. 
He's <laughs> doing well off it, but okay, so but you're okay now. Yeah, I don't know how to come to my children's room. Yeah, but I, I think now it's better. Make I see better network. No, but it's better now. Yeah, it's better now. Stay here. Yes. Mm. Okay. Okay. I'm sure network won't spoil your face before. Rubbish. <laughs> Okay, so I was asking, I said, what, what is the inspiration behind this? Because the thing is, like, in fact, eh, the wedding, not be small thing. I've seen the photo shoot. It's so beautiful, by the way. Ah, see, fish, fish girl. <laughs> With That's the shape, I see it's so beautiful. So what, what inspired? I, I deserve it. I deserve it. You I do. You do. It. See, you do. The way it's supposed to be. So this is you having your dream wedding. Yes, finally. <laughs> so can we have sneak peek into what the plan is? This sneak peek. Not it too hard now. I'm doing it in my dream look. First of all, the idea I have of you know um wedding, very renewal is something very intimate. You know, like, you know, those outdoor beach kind of things. I'm finally having my vow renewal, exchange of vow in a cathedral that is outside the venue. It's so beautiful. Mm. Then, of course, now my venue, I did my, I did my, uh, 10 years ago, I did my wedding in my church car park, two canopies. Mm. I think I saw some pictures. Yeah, I'm doing it now in Monarch Event Center. So it's it's really it's, it's that's it. There's really nothing to hide. Monarch yeah. Event Center. Then I'm having my wedding, my uh, my honeymoon. I never had an honeymoon. Okay, so where is I it? I never had a honeymoon. Zanzibar. Oh my god. I've always you know that's why when you said if we're not doing the live today, we should do it after your honeymoon. Your bed. What did I say for what? When you go there honeymoon, you go answer me. <laughs> You know? the planning the planning is intense so every day i have so much yes, to do to have i know day. i know because that's the difference when you have time to visualize and plan what you want you understand yes. because the way you think your level of mentality now the things that you have been exposed to is different from what you knew then when you were younger and it was like oh i just want to get married to the man of my dreams so yeah. now you are paying attention to detail you are about the whole works. You know what you are looking for. So the planning will be more intense than... So now, eh, anytime I look at you, anytime I see your stuff online, anytime I, I see the things you do, when, every time I see you win, it gives me goose pimples, right? Because... And then, apart from goose pimples, it gives me... Um, like, it motivates me, it inspires me. It just reminds me the fact that um dreams come true one and two um it's our perspective to what we go through once we can embrace the right perspective our obstacle is our way you understand and then once we can embrace who we are meant to be our, we, we begin to find ourselves because i know that um the first time i met you you were you were not a comedian mm -mm. Definitely not. You were not an entertainer. You were, you were into business. I think you worked in the bank too. Did you? But you no. were into business. Okay, but I know that you were into business. I know you had the salaries. Yes. Ah. Yes, yeah. I sell those, uh, yeah. Yes. Fabric. You know? Yes. I was a civil servant then as well. I was working with National yes. Service uh, for a while. Yes, civil service for. Yeah, that's true. And I'm uh, sorry, I was confusing you and you know your husband. Is your husband that was so and. I, at that point, did you ever have, was this ever a plan? Did you ever think that one day I'm going to drop this thing I'm doing? Not okay, at all. Okay, please explain to me. Please. Not at all. Okay, okay so even as a child, let me even go back to I when you were a that. child. Uh, when you were a child, what was yeah, your dream? You know, what did you think life had for you? So, as a child, I wanted to be a lawyer. Tell me. I wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. Your client but is you not so how... far, though. <laughs> so it reached time for me to enter university and I started fe pour jam, fe pour jam, fe jam, fe jam, fe jam. Now I manage just 
just get one jam. I just see one eighty. Now once my pastor, I come and go to private school. Mm. I private school. They say the law never they accredited at that time. Say so now mm. make I take a ISD or political science. Now I go my political science generally. I think after like two years, when they said, okay, we can come back. I said, I'm not coming back. I'm going to stay with political science. By that time, I already started doing dance professionally. You know, went for a couple of dance competitions and all of that. Dance so doing dance. Yes, Montana dance hall, glow rock and roll, pick, pick, you know. So I felt like, okay, now I just have to do entertainment. No need to call the go do the loan. I'm not doing For sure movie and everything so what i'm doing now is what i plan to do mm. after graduation so after i graduated from school i fell in love after internet is spoiling this gist that we're hearing now oh oh data be good to us data be good to us Oh, okay. Yeah, so I got married after nine months and everything. So I just abandoned my dance. I abandoned everything. I just started doing what I'm doing, doing my mommy duty, wife duty, civil server duty. Until social media came. Social media came and I go see people, they do video, they say, ah, ah, what's going on there? Let me start. I'm telling you. I and that time, that dance man. video, the way, no, it wasn't really yes. comedy. It was dance yeah. videos. When it started, yes, I was just, yeah, I, I, I was just, I opened my page, I was just doing one or two things, and that was how we were picking came about. So it was not really planned from childhood. I really wanted to be a lawyer, but it didn't work. Well, but this is this something you still want? It kind of uh, for wait, what I you are doing? I don't understand. I don't get how many lawyers I get. I don't want. Okay, but I don't want what was the experience of your first gig as a comedian? My first gig as a stand-up comedian. I don't really mm. call it a gig. Is a if I tell me the process or how you even felt apart from apart from what it was like, what was going on in your mind when you were going that process is how you got here. So yes, it was really what was it like? It was a quarrel versus a quarrel Abuja. I reached out to him. I said I want to perform. He said okay we give me 10 minutes. I performed and um before then, I was backstage. It was my first time. I saw comedians I was looking up to, you know, and I'm like, God, is my set okay? Will I kill it? I was just very worried and everything. And I can say after the performance, I can give myself like six over ten, you know, and then that's how I started doing stand-up comedy. And thank God it became so, it, came, it became better. I can do one hour on stage. I can do 45 minutes on stage. I can hear. I can hear you. Oh, I can hear you. Oh, love you too, baby. Somebody, okay, 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 okay. No one. So yes, so that was it. It's blank, but I can hear you. It's blank. Press that reconnect. There's something. Is there is there is there reconnect showing on your on your screen? No. Uh, why am I why am I why is it blank now? I don't know. Small thing that happened here. You know, you know, YouTube life is a bit more complicated than uh, Instagram life. That's so what I've noticed in the last few not, weeks that I've been doing. Yeah, you know, Instagram life is easier. You don't need much data to pull it off. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove you. I have to come back again. Okay. So that your face will come back. All right. Uh -huh.
Oh, okay. So maybe I should I should keep you guys busy till she comes. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, you guys have to excuse me. I'm actually exhausted today after the, the workshop today. I was standing for over eight hours, but the show was go on. The show was go on. So, okay. You're back. All right. Okay. So we're, we're talking about, um, we're talking about your effects ex experience when you, you went on stage. You said it was Akoruru. Yeah. And so what was it like when, when you, you got on stage? How did people react to you? What was going on in your mind? So because they never to know me that time, that was 2018, August, I think. They never to know me that time. Okay, woman, comedy, okay. The reaction wasn't really good. But now, compared to now, uh -uh. They come in now first. <laughs> You're like the showstopper now. <laughs> oh my god! But that 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 gets me thinking. I think I've lost her again. How women are treated in their industries. You know, there are a lot of male-dominated industries that when women come in and thrive in those industries, um, they have to go an extra mile to prove themselves. And I think entertainment is one of them, especially well, not just entertainment. Comedy is one of them. A woman has to go an, the extra mile to prove herself. And we've had, you know, we have some, you know, amazing female comedians, you know, even apart from Real Worry Picking. But I think that, it, it, you know, they have to work extra hard to just prove that, okay, they can be in this industry too. But I wonder who says that, you know, these industries are just for, uh, you know, uh, the industries are gender-based. I don't think so. I don't even think it's about the century we're living or the age we're living. I don't think industries are gender-based. I think that women just get the short end of the stick a lot of time, so we have to go an extra mile to prove ourselves. Okay, this is not me being feministic. I'm not. I am not a feminist, but I just believe that we always have to go an extra mile. I was having a conversation with one of the young millennials that attended my workshop today, and I told her, I said, that a lot of times women are, ma are made to feel shame for experiences that they have. And women are not the ones who are meant to feel that shame. Because if, for instance, a man who is maybe married decides that he wants to woo a, an 18 year old girl with money and with all the, you know, whatever. And somehow he's able to use all those things to get her to, to have something to do with him. Now, you find out that it's the girl who begins to feel shame every time. Oh, I've done this. How will people look at me? And then even the guy will join say, Oh, she's a bad girl, you know, and all that. I believe that the man should be who should be the one feeling shame because you are older, you should know better. And if you didn't know better and you decided to go after an 18 year old girl when you have a family at home or a 21 year old or whatever age or 16 year old, you have a family at home then you should be the one feeling shame. But we find out that young girls who make these mistakes based on the fact that, you know, they, they don't know any better, grow up being the ones who feel the shame, you know? So, so I was having that conversation today and I was saying, um, you learn from your mistakes, you move on. You learn to say no, you learn to walk away. Um, it's not just about men. It could be anything, but... Um, Whatever it is, society is fond of making, you know, girls be the ones to feel, um, they should get the short end of the stick. And I think it's it's completely wrong, you know, absolutely wrong. So, but anyway, I'm waiting for my guest to come back and I'm having this conversation. I'm waiting for my guest to come back. So, so... Um, I don't know if anybody agrees with me, but that's that's my experience. I believe that we have to work extra hard to prove ourselves in everything that we do. Everything. We work in an office, you're running a business. Uh, and, and you see, it's amazing because most times we're multitasking doing these things, especially when you're a mother, a wife, um, uh, and, and then you're trying to be the woman who is, you know, either building a career or 
you know, building a business, you know, and all that. That is you juggling, you know, three different things at the same time, which is even what my guest is doing. Because Anita is juggling being a mother, a wife, and, and you know, an entertainer. And I know that she travels a lot. I know that she gets to work a lot. I know that when she, she can, she, you know, takes her family with her on some of her, her work. And I also know that, lucky her, she has a very supportive husband who um, has supported her career um, all these years. But uh, I also think that sometimes those, those supportive partners are not, um, are not a dime a dozen, you know. Um, you're favored to have one, you know. So I, because I feel that women multitask a lot, you're taking on so many roles at the same time and you're trying to do these things at the same time, but society ex expects you to prove yourself that you can perform those roles and you can be the best at those roles. It's, uh, I think it's a lot. I think it's too much. Anybody should be asking of anyone. My conversations today with with Anita was going to be about, um, you know, what happens when you reach rock bottom and how you walk your way back to the top. Because I know that, you know, she had a very um, dark period in her life. Where, I mean, people's stories are always born out of pain. And she was able to navigate through that. And that was how her career took off. And I know that whatever it is that she learned from that time in her life, is one of the driving force that pushes her to do what she does. Because sometimes when you watch her or you see her work, you know there's an energy behind it that shows that this person understands that it takes grit, it takes passion, it takes um, wanting something or believing that you deserve something to have it. So she became this go-getter, this rolling, in fact, rolling stone that gathers with this roller coaster and she was just taking the world by storm and in, you know in a few months few years you know she has been able to grow the brand that she has grown now you know into what it is and you see this is what it takes for us to be seen or heard one you you have to understand what your message is and you have to know your message then know who your message is for i think i had this conversation with naomi a few weeks ago you have to know who your message is for and when you know who your message is for, you have to understand what the pain of the people your message is for is. What is their pain? What are they going through? What is it that they need out of life that your story, your message, your brand can give them? And then you have to know what the pleasure you can give your, your person or your people for their pain. Once you master these three and you now understand what your impact should be, what what do you think the world needs? <clears throat> what do you think the world needs that you want to give? What is it that the world is looking for that you have and you want to give? What do you think is lacking in the world? Today at the workshop, I asked that question. Some people thought, felt for them, what was lacking in the world was peace. Some people felt it was professionalism. Some people felt it was love. Um, some people felt it was um, unity. You know, people have different things they felt was lacking in the world. But you see, that's their own perspective to it. And it's always tied to what you're meant to you change or correct or help with. So, so it's, it's about knowing what your impact should be. What is it that I want to, what do I want to do in the world? What is it that I have that I can use to fix something in the world? For me, I believe that, um, the reason why we have mental health issues, the reason why people are going through a lot, the reason why um, we have people who are depressed, who are suicidal, who even commit suicide, which has been something that's been bothering me for a while now, especially with the rate of suicides I hear happening among young people, especially in Asia. I, I feel that these things happen because people lack a sense of purpose. Because, I mean, if you know why you wake up every morning, it will motivate you. The only reason you don't want to get out of bed is because you don't know why you are going, okay, so why am I getting up? What's the reason I'm getting up today? I don't feel that there's any reason for me to get up. It means that this person lacks a sense of purpose. He lacks his why, why he's here, what he's meant to do with it, like what he's meant to contribute to humanity. But I feel that when people figure that out and they figure out who they are, another thing that, you know, 
confuses or puts people in the dark, dark is not even knowing yourself. Because once you know who you are, then you know, you begin to connect with why you are here. But you have to know who you are, you know, first. You know, so I feel that that is what I feel the world lacks that I want to be able to give. So that is what my work is focused on. My work is focused on helping people find their identity and then connect with their why, their purpose, why they are meant to be here. Because I believe if someone connects with that, then life becomes something you look forward to living. You want to wake up every morning and just say, you know what, today I want to do something that brings me closer to you. You become more excited about life. You start to feel fulfilled. You know, it's no more about, oh, I have, you know, 10 billion in the bank. Of course, the money will come. But it's more about the fact that I feel like I'm useful, I'm valuable. There's something I'm giving and it's making a difference for somebody because whatever that purpose is, it has to be something that is adding to somebody else's life or other people's life or adding to humanity. And it could be in any industry. It could be in technology. It could be in business. It could be in finance. It could be in um, music. It could be in art. It could be in sports. It could be in, um, you know, in the health industry. It could be in hospitality. It can be anywhere. But... Where whatever industry you find yourself, it means that there's something you're meant to do in that industry that is supposed to impact the human race. So you look at comedians, for instance, you wonder, okay, someone who is a comedian, how is the person impacting the human race? I can tell you for free. When you attend a comedy show or watch a skit online and you laugh and laugh, like, you know, laughter is, a, is one of the best medicine in the world. And you laugh, laugh and laugh because you're watching this comedian at that point point when the comedian is making all that all those jokes and you're laughing you practically forget your problems and your troubles at that point in time you know um it helps people get over depression it helps people get over anxiety worry it helps people see life from a different perspective you know it helps um people get rid of negativity and that's a lot because believe me a lot of terminal illnesses that we see people go through or, or lifestyle diseases, most of them are always rooted in negative emotions. Most of the time, the emotions we feel on the inside is responsible for some of the illnesses we deal with even more than whatever we eat or consume, you know? And laughter is a medicine. And for someone to get on stage and stand there for two hours making you laugh, now that's a gift of giving you know, joy to the next person, you know? And you see, so there's nothing anyone does that doesn't, you know, have value. It has value and it's adding value to somebody. You just need to find your people, find your audience, find who your gift is meant for. Because sometimes we find our gifts, but we're trying to give it to the wrong people. In business, I'll say we're trying to give it to the wrong demograph. So you're trying to, you know, give your gift or you know, um, give your service to the wrong, you know, um, audience. And then you start getting frustrated, like, oh, I'm doing this, it's not working, nothing's happening, I'm struggling. Most times it happens that way because also because maybe your assignment is location specific. So it means that um, um, maybe I live in Lagos and my business, my career or what I do or my mission, or whatever I do, I'm doing it in Lagos, but I'm meant to do it in Benin, or I'm meant to do it in the UK, or I'm meant to do it in Canada. And because I'm doing the right thing in the wrong place, I find out that I'm struggling, or it looks like it's not working, or nobody's connecting with it, or I'm doing it on the wrong platform. Maybe I should be doing it on, on Instagram, or I should be doing it on Facebook, or I should be doing it on YouTube, but maybe I'm doing it on Twitter. So, you need to be able to know who your audience is and where your platform is. Your platform might even be um, in communities, grassroots communities. It might be in suburban areas. It could be in grassroots communities. It could be um, in classrooms. You just have to find where it is that your gift or your assignment is and where you thrive. Once you're able to figure that out, you find out that it becomes stress-free you achieve flow, you attain flow, what the Japanese call flow, where everything just flows, just happens, you know? Um, I always keep telling people that being able to achieve 
know that you're living your purpose and become fulfilled has to do with you doing what you love, what you're passionate about. But to do what you're passionate about, because passion is unharnessed. It's just something that you feel on the inside. Sometimes the passion is not even something that you were born with. Maybe you just watched something on TV and you just said, ah, I love the way that lady sings. Now I have passion for music. But if you don't continually expose yourself to music, then you begin to lose that and begin to like something else. So if I ask some of you now, you say, okay, there was something you used to like 10 years ago. You don't really like it anymore. You started liking something else five years ago. It must have been something you were passionate about, but because you didn't continually expose yourself to it or develop some form of, um, try to harness it or develop it, you lose that passion. And then you have gifts, talents. Those are the innate gifts that you came with. It might be that you are very eloquent, you have a beautiful voice that you can use to sing or do a voiceover, or it might be that um, you're very good with connecting with people or you're a good communicator. It might be that you're very, a very good actor act or actress. It might be that um, you're a very good painter or sports person or um, you love to help people. Um, you, know, uh, you know, sometimes you're growing up, you see people who love to treat animals, you know, and all that. And then they grow up wanting to read medicine, become doctors and all that. <clears throat> so we're always born with these talents or gifts that are also in their raw state and we need to harness them. So it's in harnessing them, they become skills. When you start trying to train to harness kids, kids. So, so you say, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I have a good voice. Okay, so let me do a voice training and become, you know, a musician. Oh, I, I love to help people. So let me go to school and train as either a vet or a doctor or a nurse or a psychologist or a therapist. So you're beginning to build skill on what you're like. Oh, I, I love computers. Okay, so let me start doing software certifications to know, um, to be able to make myself useful in this area or in, or in that area, in finance, in business, in science or something. Oh, I'm curious about the human body. Oh, I want to become a, um, I want to study genetics so I can help to, you know, discover, you know, whatever genetics do. Um, what they call them, I don't know. Anybody who read genetics did, you know. So this is how it works. So it all starts with having a gift and then wanting to harness that gift to become a skill. Now, when it becomes a skill, it means that you can be paid for it. Now you can be paid for what you do because now you have turned your talent and what you are passionate about, which were in their raw state, you've turned them into skills. And skills are things that we can do that add value to other people and they can pay us for it. Now you have that, you pause. Then you go back to what I said about finding what the world needs that you can give. So now when you find what the world needs that you can give, make sure it's tied to your skill. So it means that you can be paid for it. So what do we have now? We have, we have a complete full circle. We have a human being who is doing something he loves, he's passionate about, and he's doing that thing using the gifts, innate gifts that he has. So, and your gifts are the things that the... the the talents you have that make things look seem easy to other people who don't have it. You understand? I, I remember a friend of mine who told me, I make writing look easy. But when she tries it, she knows that it's not easy. It's not because it's, well, I'll still say it's not because it's not easy, but because of the gift I have. <clears throat> it comes easy and natural to me. But it's not a gift she has. She has her own gift, you know? Like if she does make up for you, it, I mean, it is amazing. I can never make up to that extent. I can never, I try, but I can I never get there. But that's her gift. She's artistic and she knows how to make it look good on the human face. But then I can write. So whatever you can do that make, looks easy, is so easy to you, comes natural to you, but every other person looks at it and goes like, man, you must be a genius. You must be a maestro. You must have superpowers for you to be able to achieve this. Now that's your gift. Now imagine how fulfilling and beautiful life will be for you that you can do what you love using the gifts that you have, that you have harnessed properly, turn them into skills that are valuable that somebody can say, I want you to do this for me. And I'm going to pay you for what you're doing for me. And then you can harness them to that point and say, you know what? I think 